Uh, well, let's let's get to it. Uh, I'm going to put this up on uh, my YouTube channel, of course, uh, after, you know, probably in a day or two. Um, but uh, I wanted to cover the uh, Hako desoldering gun. And I'm going to switch my view over to uh, my other cam. So give me a second. OK. So unlike a regular desoldering, or sorry, a regular soldering iron, uh, obviously this one has the hole in the nozzle over here, enable you to, you know, suck a solder through it uh, and desolder as well as solder. I, I actually use this as my main soldering iron as well as desoldering, uh, just because it's just very handy to have. Uh, you don't have to have two, uh, you know, a soldering iron and a desoldering iron uh, gun plugged in you know, it's just, it's kind of bulky. Uh, as far as uh, cleaning this thing, I'm going to, I'm going to show you how to, how it works. And I'm going to really get into it uh, quite a bit. Uh, but before we do that, um, I'm actually going to go to their website. All right. This is the Hako website. It's HakoUSA.com. Okay. And so here's the desoldering gun. And down here, this is what I think a, a lot of people uh, are missing. The N N61 nozzle. So all of these tabs are very important. So it takes the N61 nozzle. Now it's important to know that the old desoldering gun is does not have the same nozzles as the new ones. They're not interchangeable. So if anybody has the old one, they can't just assume all the old nozzles fit in their new uh, desoldering gun. You have to uh, you have to buy all new nozzles. Spec specs I don't really get into too much. But uh, this right here, uh, just a sec, let me, there we go. Uh, you can see all the different types of nozzles uh, they can buy. You can see these kind of wider nozzles. Um, I've never actually used these longer ones myself. Um, I think that there could be um, more solder that can get stuck in this one. So I like the, the shorter nozzles like these, okay? Now the ones that I use uh, typically and so these are the ones that I use. Um, the 0.8 is a little small, but it, it's good for really small pins. I just really don't use it because it's so close to the one millimeter, which I use regularly. Also, I use the 1.3 over here on the left and the 1.6. So those are really the three that I use um, regularly, okay? Uh, okay, as far as accessories, this, this one right here, is sweet. I have two of them and they hold the desoldering gun really well. If you're in a shop environment, uh, I don't use it in the home. Um, just because, uh, I don't know, it's just, it's a little bulky when you're working, you know, on an appliance, usually customers don't have a lot of counter room for you to work with. Um, so, but it's nice for a shop, uh, shop environment. Now, uh, this guy right here is also really important. It's the cleaning drill. And uh, where that would go is like, you'd have to take the tip off here, off the left. You have to take the, the nozzle off, out. And I'm gonna show you how to do that in a bit here. Uh, and then that goes through here all the way through. And you, you wanna clean it out because you have solder that can get stuck inside uh, and, and you just have to clean it out periodically, it's a mess. So having this cleaning drill is really important. Uh, these right here are kind of, smaller versions of this. They don't have a drill bit like this one, but with these, and you can see there's different uh, diameter uh, versions for, for these guys right here, right? You don't have to take the nozzle off. You just put it through there and clean it out. It's kind of a quick clean out, okay? Um, this one right here, this drill is more, you know, for a, 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 a regular maintenance uh, that you want to do maybe once a month or something like that. But, but the, these guys right here, the cleaning pins, I use them every time I use the desoldering gun to just make sure that there's no, you know, uh, solder in there. Um, oh, there it is right there. So they put this, the one millimeter pin on this page for whatever reason. Uh, we're going to get into this and this later. Uh, not so important as I'll show you. I've, I've, I don't, I can imagine that you could eventually have like a hole maybe or a crack in one of these. This is for the section uh, inside that I'm going to show you in a bit, but I've never, never had to replace one uh, in 20 years. So I don't think you're going to need it. 
but uh, this valve right here is also uh, in the uh, inside the uh, suction chamber, and I'll show you how to clean that. Um, I think I have had to replace that on my old uh, desoldering gun, but not on my new ones yet. Okay. All right. So that's uh, so if you have like if you're looking for stuff uh, for it now, you don't have to buy it off the of Hako site. You can obviously. Um, but, uh, but a lot of times I'll just go to eBay, but I'll get the part number from here. So I'll just, you know, B1087 and I'll just get an eBay tab and, and put that in Hako B1087 and then, you know, buy it off of eBay just cause it's easier and cheaper. So, so this is the, uh, the cleaning pin I was telling you about every time I use this every time I push it like this through and you just want to go back and forth. And sometimes some will come out, sometimes not. Um, this guy right here, it's nice on, on the new one, this one locks, but on the old 808, uh, this did not see that right there. That has a locking mechanism. So when you take, and this conveniently says uh, front, and that, that way you know uh, which one, uh, which way to put it in, but you can easily uh, take this in and out. Okay. And then when you press this button, it just locks it in there. So that's, that's nice. Cause the old one didn't have that. These pads right here, they get really nasty and grimy after you use them. And so what you want to do is definitely get like a 10 pack of these. Again, I got them on eBay. Um, and change them out periodically. If you don't, eventually this will get grimed up so much that you'll lose the um, vacuum action uh, and it'll be just like a weak vacuum. Okay. Uh, so let's take this guy out. This, this right here. Okay. So that guy catches the solder. This is where the solder gets sucked to and gets uh, trapped right there. So you want to clean that out periodically. Um, if you don't, then same thing. It'll just get kind of bunched up in there and, and it'll inhibit the vacuum. Okay, so that, that goes into those slots. If you see that right there, two slots. Okay. Um, and that goes back on here. The older ones were kind of easier to push, easier to push in, but anyways. Um, so this this guy right here also, you want to just make sure that this hole is is nice and clear. You can sometimes get little beads of solder uh, on there as well. Here. So these are all uh, extra parts. Actually, some of these are for the old 808, like this. So that's we can I can I still have my 808, but I never use it. But I don't need those in my box now. You have the uh, 0.8 millimeter pin. Now the problem I have with this pin is it's it's really thin, and it's it's so it just kind of <laughs> it's like a thin wire, uh, so it's kind of useless. I mean, you know, so I use the one millimeter, uh, which is slightly bigger, but this one won't bend on you. So that's that's that. Uh, I do have pin the pins where you saw there 1.3 and 1.6 as well, but really I don't use the 1.6. Uh, it's just the one and the 1.3, de depending on the uh, the nozzle I'm using. So you have you know different nozzles, and I just keep them all in here. Obviously, if you uh, are trade trading out nozzles, I I use this guy right here. It's glass, so you can put hot nozzles in it, and uh, with no problem. <clears throat> you don't want to put the hot nozzle on anything plastic, obviously, or else. Uh, it's going to melt into it. So that's where I just keep all my stuff. And then when I'm done with it, I just close it up. Uh, this guy right here is for removing uh, the nozzle. So you get that action right there. Like that. And then I just slide it in there. So it's that's that's hot and it won't damage it now if i want to handle it i just handle it with you know set of pliers so so this guy right here you probably won't need to uh go into 
very often at all. Uh, but I did have to on my new desoldering guns. I have two. I bought them for obviously one for me. I really didn't need to because I had the 808. But I figured since the 808 wow. is uh, since the 808 is uh, uh, discontinued, I, I didn't want to do classes with an old discontinued model. So I bought two uh, of the 301s for the classes. <clears throat> now, um, so I actually lost suction on one. It was really weak and I had cleaned everything out and it was still weak. And how I could tell is, is I put my thumb right up in here to feel the vacuum, right? That, and I wasn't feeling a lot of vacuum at all. Uh, so uh, compared to the other one as well. So, um, so what I did was I, I, I went ahead and took this all apart like this, okay? Now, again, you only have to do this, you know, maybe once, in, once or twice in the life of the unit. Uh, and we're talking about, you know, probably 10, 15 years. So, you know, this part is, you know, just so you know, but uh, you won't, I don't expect you to do it once a week, you know, <laughs> so um, it is a little, a little difficult to take these, uh, these hoses off. Well, I guess not last time it was, <laughs> um, but you can see here, you know, this is the chamber. This is where the magic happens. Okay. okay. This guy first. There we go. And that's really that's really all we're gonna need. Uh, I, last time I did take apart the four, but um, it was really not necessary. You can see the diaphragm. Basically, you take this off, and that's where the diaphragm goes back and forth. But there's nothing to do in there, so there's no need to take these other four off. So, so what we're looking at here, what we're missing <laughs> is this guy right here. You remember from the website, that's what we saw, right? Okay, and basically it's a valve similar to the, uh, you know, just any valve like, uh, I don't know if you guys saw uh, Walter Bommie's uh, com uh, LG compressor teardown, where he, uh, he, he uh, it was a linear compressor and he uh, took it all apart um, and he showed the valve inside, there's a single valve that splits. And it actually kind of reminded me of that. It's just like a little metal valve like this, and it just had a split in it. So if ever you see this torn, you're not going to get vacuum. You're not going to get suction, right? But what can happen is, is the flux, <clears throat> you know, you're, when you're soldering or desoldering, in this case, uh, you're melting that flux, right? And that flux, you're sucking in the solder, but you're also sucking in some flux along with that solder, right? And so what's happening is it's coming in as a vapor and it's being sucked through here as a vapor and it's going all the way into this vacuum chamber where it's solidifying on this, this guy right here. Okay, so you may ask, well, what do we do in that case? We just buy a new one? No, because what you can do is this and take a little isopropyl alcohol and just kind of spray it down, okay? And then uh, take some paper towel. I'm gonna, this is a virtual paper towel, okay? So I'm just using my glove. And, and so you wipe it down until you get all that, all, oh, sorry, you wipe it down, right? And until it's not yellow, until it's clear again, okay? Uh, and then you just, you go ahead and you put it all back together. There is a little notch right here. There, you see the little notch? And that lines up on here. See that notch right, oh, sorry, there. Right there, you see that notch? So it lines up. So that way you can't put it in backwards. Okay. That's, uh, and then you put it all back together and you're back in business. Not a lot of rocket science. 
Um, but it's all a mystery until you take it apart, right? Uh, these are machine screws, so like you know, you just want to make sure you know the 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 back it up before you screw it in trick, right? How many own a uh, desoldering gun? I picked one up uh, two weeks ago. Okay. Have you used it in the field, or is it still in the shop? I used it uh, that day to replace, um, I think, a relay on the board that I uh, called you about. That the tip was too small. That's when I asked you about the the bigger tip sizes. So I picked, um, got to order that one, the bigger size, but yeah. that repair went well. So let's say here's the pin and here's your nozzle. You can go up right next to the, the pin at a kind of a diagonal and then suck the solder and it'll, it'll just suck away. And a lot of times you can get away with that. Not all times, but. Uh, yeah, that's what I, uh, that's what I ended up doing. Yeah. Um, and then I'm like, Hey, a bigger tip maybe would have made it a little faster, but, uh, it worked out especially with those ovens the uh, 240 you know heaters they they like those larger pins on those relays um the other part of that is uh when you have a, a, a it's it's like a it's a uh sorry it's called the via and it's basically it connects on a on a dual layer board it connects the the component side to the, the, the other, the bottom uh, of the board, okay? So imagine if you have a component up here and then you have the pin and it goes down through the board, uh, the pad is a via and it has actually, it's like a, a rivet that goes through with a hole in it, obviously, and then it, it's up on top. So it, it really kind of looks like a rivet, if you get my meaning. Now, when you have one of those, a dual layer board that, that's like that, it's very, very difficult to use a pump because a pump, uh, you know, not the desoldering gun, but just a regular pump. Um, I have one here. There we go. So, you know, this, the pump. I don't use it, but I have it. I don't, I don't know why I carry it, but uh, I have it. <laughs> so, uh, uh, it's really difficult when you have a dual layered board to do that because you have to get all the soldering that's on the pad, right? But also all that solder that's in the via that's connecting the upper pad as well. So there's just so much that you got to get that without the desoldering gun, it's just, it's, it's like you have to basically melt it. You probably know what I'm talking about if you've done those boards where you, you melt one pin and it kind of moves a bit out and then you melt another pin solder in contact and it, it kind of moves out and you kind of walk it out like that. So those can be a pain, especially those oven boards. Um, if you don't have a desoldering gun, uh, you know, I, I don't know of any real competition to the Hakko desoldering gun. Uh, I, I can't even, I mean, I know there's one actually, um, uh, Thai, Thai has one that's a, a, kind of a Chinese knockoff. I think it's about a half, about half price. He likes it. That's, uh, you know, that's good. Uh, if, if you're interested in a cheaper version, then, then ask him about it. But I've never actually used it. What about the, um, like, there's a couple on um, Amazon. You go to Amazon right now, they come right up. It begins with why you uh, or something. Um, any idea how they are? I mean, it was, it was like it was under a hundred bucks, and it seemed it looks really nice. And what they describe, it's made of metal, but I don't know the first thing about them, so I don't want to buy something that's so generic that I regret it later. Yeah, that's what I. That's definitely what I've experienced. Is you know, you buy the cheap stuff because it's cheap, and then it falls apart on you, and then you buy the good stuff. And so, my my recommendation in general is just buy the good stuff and you're buying it at a discount because you didn't pay for the cheap stuff. <laughs> now, oh, yeah. actually, actually what I've done uh, a lot for the re-engineers is actually bought all of it. I mean, as far as ESR meters, I can't even count how many ESR meters I have. I, I literally can't think of how many I have. Different ones as well as the amount I have just for the classes. And the reason for it is because people are saying, oh, well, what about this one? What about that one? And, uh, you know, you know, is it going to be a good one? So I wanted to 
I didn't want to just say, hey, don't buy the cheap stuff because it's don't buy the cheap stuff because I've tried it and it's garbage, <laughs> you know, uh, that, and, and this is my experience. Now I know there've, there've been, I know of at least one guy that left the re-engineers because I mentioned, Hey, I had a $50 ESR meter. Uh, I have multiple units of that same one and they're just not good. And he was saying, I was talking trash about him. I'm like, I'm just, I'm talking from my experience with the ones I own. And so that's not talking trash. If I didn't own them, had no experience on them, then yeah, my argument would not be as credible. And that's why I can't talk to this specific uh, desoldering gun you're talking about because I have no experience with it. Uh, and I look, $300 plus is a lot of money to spend on a tool. But if you're charging professional prices, then, you know, you want professional tools as well you know um for me if i if i uh do two f1 air you know motor relays uh that's you know that's like 500 dollars right there and that that pay, more than pays for pretty much everything you'll need uh from a desoldering gun so and it's in and out i mean you you replace a, a, a that that relay it's it's real quick some people say oh i don't have time for board repair it's like <laughs> it's, some of those repairs are so quick and the customer's like oh you're done already <laughs> it's like yeah so obviously you you have to get good at it it's just like all of us in appliance repair what did you step in the door your first day on your first customer and you were like as quick as you are right now no, none of us, you know. Uh, so, you, yeah, it's a new part of appliance repair that some people are are delving into. Um, but if you want to make money, it's a good way to do it. Board repair is very lucrative. Tess, what's your what's your experiences since uh, doing the class? What was that 2018? Um, yes, um, I had really good experiences uh, with the. Uh, you know, board repair, um, a lot of times, you know, I can look at a board and you can just see that there's a cat blown or something, you know, that capacitor has got to be replaced right there. Yeah. And uh, then, you know, wham, bam, yeah. and, and you're and you're on your way. You know, sometimes I got to go home and do it real quick, you know, and then just come back. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, the question that I have is that, if uh, you aren't taking um, this tool out into the field, then when you get out into the field, what do you what do you use? Do you use the braid then? Uh, no, I do. I do use this in the field for sure. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, I'm. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm. I'm trying to remember. I <laughs> what the what what I was talking about at that time. Your stand. Your stand. Oh. You left the stand there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was the. Uh, this guy right here. So I, right on. I, yeah, I have two of those, one for my soldering iron and one for my desoldering gun in the shop. Uh, but in the house, the reason I don't use that is because a lot of times we're in unstable environments. If I'm doing an F1 on a motor uh, for, for a, a, a Whirlpool dryer, I'm actually using the top, uh, the drum. Yeah. As, as, as my workstation. Well, yeah. You know, and how, how are you going to get that on the top of a drum and try to be stable and everything? So what I use is, uh, you know, in the field is this. I, what I do is is I put a, uh, a, a towel on there. Okay. And then put this down and then put the, uh, you know, the soldering gun on here, right? Okay. And so that protects uh, – the, the, the towel is my uh, – I think I mentioned this last time. It's it's my uh, my warning, uh, my er, 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 warning. Uh, in other words, if for whatever reason my iron, soldering iron or desoldering gun slips off of that of that uh, clipboard, right? Where does it go? It goes onto the towel, and uh, uh -huh. a burning towel. <laughs> you'll you'll start smelling it, and you'll start seeing the smoke. Now that's much better. Than, uh, than destroying a, a carpet or, or a, you know, their, their sure. countertop if they have, you know. So 
I, I, you know, it's just, it's, it doesn't happen really. Uh, if anything, it just kind of slips for a second or something like that, but it's just a safe day. You know, I, it's probably more mental than anything. Like, I don't know, eight, 17, 18 years ago, I burned a carpet. I was working at the uh, circuit city doing yeah. repair and I burnt this carpet and it was a white, nice carpet. And it, it that's always going to stick with me. You know, right. having that conversation with my manager, I, I just remember it very vividly. <laughs> <laughs> so so it's just it's one of those things that i'm kind of pet peeve about i guess but, right on yeah well i'm glad that you uh you know kept up with it and everything um so. yeah i'm yeah i'm hoping to you know get a little bit better with the with the npn i don't know if that is actually a necessary component for the board that i was talking about earlier um, but it was just something that came with it. And I just ended up um, ordering, ordering another board because. Uh, uh, well, I'll tell you that, that those kits, um, it's kind of like if you got on a Samsung dryer and the symptom is it's making noise. And what do you, what do you go with? Okay. You buy a kit, let's say on, okay, what are they going to sell you? Gonna say the four rollers, the shafts, you know, the idler pulley, the belt. and, and it's Okay. Wrong. Okay. So, yeah, it's just like everything that could go wrong. That's right. It's in the kit. Okay. Gotcha. But, but if we have a DIYer customer and he puts all that kit in, well, there's no guarantee that he actually did it right. Right? No. So no. done a lot of weird stuff that we can't even imagine as technicians. Right? <laughs> 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 so true. Um but and then we have to fix it but why do we fix it because we know how to diagnose properly we don't just throw parts at a problem and uh, we okay gotcha yeah the difficulty there is when you have a diy they create a problem and then you have to fix that and you're like i don't know if it fixed your original problem then you gotta test it out. yeah that costs extra <laughs> uh, no but they think it's a discount it's like oh i took it apart for you give me give me a discount for that like, that is the discount you didn't yeah. help me <laughs> so um but yeah as far as um um we're talking about you know the with the with the board repair you know not having to go home and and do that is, is yeah is the next step i think for you and being confident okay. is, is there a confidence issue where you feel like maybe somebody's going to be looking over your shoulder or something like that um no, um, the confidence issue, I think, is having uh, the right components with me in the first place, because that will be, you know, why I would, you know, um, take the board and then, you know, actually go somewhere else where somebody else has all the components, because I don't have all the components. So that would be probably the next step. There was a where there was a time when I had everything in a backpack, all the components and 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 everything, and then my vehicle got hit, you huh. know, and I got all that stuff stolen, and it just like kind of, you know, sits wrong on your soul, like somebody stealing part of your life, you know what I mean? But well, have to replace it eventually. A horrible neighborhood to be in. <laughs> <laughs> Right now, now I'm like bringing everything in at night. But actually, when this got stolen, it was um, I had a, a key fob that um, would accidentally open my trunk. When I'm in the customer's house and my key is in my pocket, which I don't put it in my pocket anymore, um, it would click and it would open the trunk and I was in East Bakersfield. And goodbye, everything. Oh, man. Yeah, well, live and learn, right? Yeah. As far as uh, what what to have on your on, in your stock, you know, it, I do. It's really simple. If I if I see I need one, I just order multiple every time. Even if I see, even if it's the first time, because it's just so cheap to just add it to the Mauser cart, you know, and then mm -hmm. I, it just accumulates. You have three or four parts in there. Uh, different parts and you order five or six of each and then boom check out uh, it's 
you know, it's, it's a very, it's very convenient to do that. And you don't have to pay a lot of shipping that way. Cause if you pay every ship, you know, you get like, okay, uh, 20, 10 microfarad capacitors. And it's like, you know, three fifty or something like that, $3 and 50 cents. And then you're paying shipping, like, you know, $8. That's a, that's a, that's that, that ratio. I'm not a big fan of, but you get three or four parts in there, you know, five, five of each or something like that, then the seven or the eight dollar shipping is not so bad. So mm. yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Um yeah, I don't have I don't have a lot of the tools that you have, you know, and like I said, my friend has got his workbench all set up to where, you know, he's ordered a lot of these parts and relays and capacitors and stuff. And so it's just a couple minutes. Usually I'm in Southwest Bakersfield anyway. So it's only like five, 10 minutes away, mm -hmm. you know, to run there and do it and then go back. Right. Oh, okay. Cause he's got the full everything, desoldering guns, everything. So <laughs> it's my little, my little shop away from shop. <laughs> and, and who was that? His name is Whale, but he is not, uh, appliance tech, although he has he has helped me with uh, with a Neptune um, bearings once oh, wow. that was that was rough. It was really rough, but it was really fun for me. But it wasn't very fun for him, <laughs> so he, he didn't want he didn't want he didn't want to throw in on the next bearing job. So <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Pull the switcheroo, you know, tell him it's something, and then, oh, by the way, it's actually a bearing job. Yeah, <laughs> probably not, <laughs> probably not. No, but he does, like, um, a lot of uh, home security and cameras and stuff like that, um, garage door openers, you know, he'll talk to me about, you know, blown capacitors on garage door openers and stuff like that, so. Mm-hmm. Like you don't do those, right? No. Okay. No, I'm strictly with appliances. Thanks, Mike. Mm -hmm. Sure. We can open it up if it, if nobody has any other uh, comments or questions to uh, other topics. You know, I I just got a question about the you now. Do you use a magnifying glass? Is that one of the tools? Yes, uh, I carry. I don't know how many. Um, these guys right here, it's a 10 times magnifier loop. And this in conjunction with a, uh, you know, flashlight is your best friend as far as like finding, you know, small fractures, you know, cracks in solders, uh, you know, cold solder joints, etc. cetera. Um, my eyes are kind of starting to, to get to where I'm, I'm, I'm going to need glasses pretty soon here. That's what I think either laser surgery or glasses. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's an invaluable tool. The other tool that I have uh, for magnification uh, <clears throat> is the phone. As you can, you know, if, if you don't have the loop handy, which I always, I, I have one in my regular bag and then also in my uh, uh, soldering kit as well. Uh, but if I just want really quick, you know, some sort of mag magnification is you zoom in on your phone. You know, I, my iPhone gets four times magnification. So uh, that's handy too. Now, um, mm -hmm. can you, uh, the, the capacitors, um, are, is there some of them that are um, polarized? Yes. Yeah. Okay. You can have electrolytic capacitors that are not polarized. In, I, I don't, think in appliances i've ever changed one that was not polarized okay uh so in my kit i do not have any non-polarized electrolytic capacitors and um my fluke that'll discharge capacitors i, I forget the model number of it but um yeah it's the standard fluke that everybody has you get the amp meter one and the other one yep that'll discharge caps right yeah, you put it on the uh, diode setting. Yeah, yeah, and that'll. Because right. when you because I've never used an ESR before. I'm gonna get one. I'm gonna get the one you showed. It had all the 
and you did a video on one. Um, yeah, but, you know what? I, we have time. I can go through the that ESR meter if you want. I have it right here. Sure, because I'm going to buy that one without a doubt. I'm okay. going to get that I first. Learning how to use its functions, uh, you know, for me, obviously, you know, I've been using not this same one, uh, the um, EDS version, but it's very, very, very similar. But I've been using these same ESR meters for, you know, 20 years. So kind of in my brain, I just think, oh, just ESR, you know, <laughs> uh, but people are like, wait a minute, <laughs> what are all these buttons and stuff? So I kind of forget that, you know, it's, it's a good thing to, to go through the explanation. Um, I do have one video on my YouTube channel uh, with the ESR meter, but it is with the old EDS. It's not, it's not with the new uh, BK Precision. And so, so that's why I was thinking that it might be handy to, to go through this, the functions of the, uh, the BK Precision. Um, because then what was happening is people were saying, hey, I, where can I get this ESR meter? And it's like, oh, it's not it's not the EDS is not in business anymore. They basically sold the rights to some guy in Merced. And so he's putting them together and shipping them out, but it's not, it's not the original company uh, that's manufacturing them. So that's why I recommend the BK precision is, you know, it's a very good ESR meter and uh, the company's still in business. <laughs> so. Uh, All right. So how many people, uh, either have or are planning to get an ESR meter like this? I have one, Moses has one as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm just gonna go over from, from ground zero here. Um, so to switch it on, there's a switch on the side here. Okay. It does take a uh, nine volt battery. And what you're hearing there is not normally what you would hear is that right there is when you short these together, right? Then you see the DCR low come up. Now, it, it, for this over here, it just tests ESR only. For that switch in this position, it tests both DCR and ESR. Now I'm gonna explain in short, without getting too technical, uh, what both of these are. So a lot of people may ask, why can't I just use my regular DMM to test capacitance and see if the tap is defective? Uh, and that's because we're not testing capacitance when we're using the ESR meter, we're testing uh, the resistance. You may say, well, Mike, if, I, if you test the resistance on a capacitor, it's gonna be in the mega ohms. And what does that tell you? Well, your DMM is gonna test DC resistance. Okay, so it should be very, very high. Okay, and that's why it shouldn't do this. If you short the leads, that's a, a short circuit for DCR or uh, DC resistance. Okay, um, so the first thing it does when it senses a component, and I, uh, before I get into it, that's that's the model number right there, uh, 881. Um, the first thing it does is test. DC resistance on the component that it's testing. And it auto senses when you have a component. In other words, it's, it's basically searching for a component right now and it's not finding any. Uh, so what, what I'm gonna do is, and these are reversible. It doesn't matter uh, if you put it this way or this way. Okay, so the first thing it tests is uh, DCR. Now, if, if the DCR is acceptable, then it doesn't tell you anything, it just, goes on to the ESR reading portion of it. But if the DCR is shorted, then you'll get that warning right there, okay? Now, the ESR, you want it to be as low as possible, okay? And so here you see 0.1 on the scale, that's perfect. That 0.1 or lower, which obviously is off the scale, uh, if you have any capacitor that shows up at 0.1 right there, then you do not have to read the capacitance. That capacitor is good. Move on. Okay. Um, the and so the reason is because it's such good uh, ESR that uh, any capacitor value is going to fall in that range. So you're good. Okay. Now, 
I'm going to test this capacitor, which just happens to be a 470 microfarad, 50 volt capacitor. So if we look on the chart here, and this one reason I really like this guy is the chart is right in front of your face and it gives you a reading uh, right here. Uh, other ESR meter meters will give you a number readout and that's it. And it's like, what do I do with that number? You know, it's, you know, it's 0.93, you know, ohms. What do I do with that? Okay. This gives you a graph to tell you whether it's good, marginal, or, or bad. Okay. Obviously the, the blue on this one is good. Uh, white is marginal and red is bad. That is not uh, on all the, the uh, ESR meters like that. Some of them change these colors up. So you might have green and white and red on some ESR meters. Anyways, so we're, I'm gonna, this is 4, 470 at, uh, at 50 volts, right? So we can see on here, 470 is right there. So really for this to be a good cap, we need it to be 0.1 and not lower because 0.2, is already in the red for 470. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and test it. Okay, and there it is. It's where it should be. That tells me that this cap capacitor is good. It's not shorted or else I would have gotten that alarm, which happens sometimes. You know, the uh, uh, the inverters for the three-phase compressors, if you've ever taken them apart, sometimes those large, capacitors in the power supply, there's either one or two, depending on the, the uh, version, um, will be kind of domed and bubbled up. Um, if you test the DC resistance uh, of one of those two caps, um, a lot of times it will be a direct short. So the capacitor shorted internally, okay? And that will blow out part of the power supply. <laughs> so. Uh, you know, direct short of 120 volts to neutral. Um, actually, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's not, it's not that. It's, it's after the uh, bridge rectifier. So I apologize for that. But, you know, it can obviously blow, blow out the other components that are in line. It definitely pops the fuse on there. There's a little round uh, cylindrical fuse at the very start of that circuit. Anyways, um, so I'm going to test some other components here of different values. So this one right here, no, that's 470 again, so I don't want to do that. This one is 220. So if we look at the chart, 220 is right here. So this one's a little different in that it has a little gray area. That's not literally a gray area, but it's a white area, but, uh, but it's a marginal area, okay? So we could go up to 0.4, and still be okay, all right? So let's go ahead and test it. Just a sec. Oh, that is testing. Very good. See, it's 0.1 ohms. It's very good. So um, I'm gonna test something a little, a little lower on the scale here. This one's 47 microfarads. So that's a point, point 0.5. There's a point 0.5 here. So 47 at point 0.5. Again, very good. I'm testing all new capacitors. So if you're expecting a failed capacitor, it's not very likely at all. <laughs> uh, so let's see. I get get another lower value. This one's two point two, um, and so two point two is over here, and so we can be all the way down to here and still be okay. And there we go. So that's three ohms um, of equivalent series resistance. Okay. That's that's pretty much how you use it. Um, one thing that I would uh, caution you on is this: is uh, sometimes uh, people will will test a capacitor will be like one in the red. Let's say if you have uh, 4.5 uh, ohms on a 22 microfarad capacitor, uh, and you say, "Oh, it's in the red," that means it's bad. Eh, 
just think of it. It's, it's, it's not really bad. It'll probably work. And it's probably not your problem. Okay. Um, think of this as kind of a, 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 a grade school scale. Okay. So you have kind of, you know, a plus, let's say for the, for a 10 microfarad, there's an a plus, and then you go down to a, and then a B, and then you get into the C area, C minus, and then D, and then way off the chart down here, that's like an F, right? Like if it's 30 ohms of resistance or more, 20 or 30, yeah, that's an F. And so don't look at it as, you know, just these three colors. Try to go through a full kind of mental, um, you know, grade scale of the capacitor. The other part of it is you can use this um, in most cases over probably 99% of the time, maybe 98 plus. Uh, of the time, uh, the circuit does not interfere with this reading. And the reason for that is because the resistance is so low typically that any parallel resistance is gonna be so high that it's not gonna have an influence uh, on your reading. That makes sense? Because if, if we were dealing in kilo ohms, then you could very well have a compromised reading in circuit. But since this is so low in resistance, then the rest of the circuit in parallel typically doesn't uh, affect it. Um, I have run into a couple of cases where that's not the case. If you see something squirrely you're not sure about, um, then go ahead and take the capacitor out of circuit and then test it out of the circuit. But for the most part, you'll never have to do that. I mean, like I said, 98, 99% of the time, I, I won't test the capacitor out of circuit. It's always in circuit, almost always. So when you have a board that's blown and you don't know what's blown on it, the capacitors all look good. So you check them with this. And obviously, I mean, what do you, what's, what's the most failed components? I know you're going to have a relay, obviously, because it's mechanical, but relay, capacitor, is there anything else? That's more common, I'm, I guess, is what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Just a second. Let me, there we go. Switch it up. Yeah. About 30, 30, between 30 and 40% of the components the, of the capacitors that I replace uh, are, are, you can see a, some physical issue with them, like a domed capacitor or a leaking capacitor. Um, these are physical signs of damage, but but it's only it only amounts about between thirty and forty percent of the ones that I see that are defective. Um, all the rest that I see that are defective, using my ESR meter, um, I test them and I see they're defective by the meter. Make sense? Yep. Yeah, and and this kind of maybe astounds some people or not. I don't know, but uh, but for me, uh, in history, in in about you know ten years of uh, uh, well, yeah, about 10 years of owning my own business, well, eight, eight or nine of own, owning my own business, you know, that's about the percentage that I come across. So that's a really significant amount of uh, capacitors that you won't see blown. I just, I replace them. I know that they're failed like that uh, 10 microfarad uh, at 50 volt um, for the, um, you know, Maytag Whirlpool uh, uh, French door units, the Iceland board, right? That small capacitor next to the microprocessor that fails. You'll never see that bubbled up. All the small capacitors, if you have a small capacitor that failed, they won't bubble up. You won't see a physical sign of mm. failure. Um, the only way to test is with an ESR meter. And what you're going to see on the ESR meter when you do test it is it'll, it'll, it'll be up here up in the 30 ohm region, if, if at all. On some of them, it won't even register on the scale. You're sitting there, you're trying to get good contact and it's not even registering it as a capacitor. It's that, it's that failed, okay? So uh, that's one of the only drawbacks that you have on a unit like this is it doesn't have a very high, like if it's, if you have a capacitor that has like a Oh, you know, 100 or 200 ohms uh, of ESR, it won't show you that. Uh, whereas some of the other ESR meters uh, will. Uh, this is this is one of the many ESR meters I have. 
Now, if you think about it like this, um, you know, this really, you know, nice, nice display and all. Um, but how do I know when I put this on a capacitor in the field and I test it and I get a reading? How do I know if it's good or not? If that reading for that specific capacitor and that, that microfarad rating, how do I know if it's good or not? You have to look it up. And how do you, what do you do? Look it up, you look it up on a chart. And so that's, that's not very efficient. And that's why when I'm in the field, that's why I use this because the chart, it's everything is right in front of you. It's rugged. This thing is really, uh, really an adorable case you know, so I don't have to worry about, you know, chucking it in my bag and, you know, if it's going to, you know, fail or not, I have a full confidence in it. So, uh, as far as the other part of your question, uh, obviously relays and capacitors are the vast majority of failed parts that you will, um, come across. Now, have you, have you gone through the playlist? It's, I don't know, 26 or 27 videos on my YouTube channel uh, specifically for board repair and appliance uh, repair. I haven't. I was actually watching the fourth episode, which was, the, I think, the one before this one. Um, I was watching it, and I never. I just don't have time. I'm finished. I get 10 minutes here and 40 minutes here, and but I'm, in the, I'm still in the middle of watching that. And, um, you know, I, I, my experience with board repair, I wanted to get into it a while back, was using the little sucker, and I had some wick, and I just couldn't desolder. I'm like, this this is too hard for me. I'm not doing this. So I did manage to do one relay on a board, but it didn't work. And this was just for my own, in my shop, you know, it wasn't for a customer or anything. And I just was experimenting on my own before I ever, you know, heard of you guys. And um, I'm beginning to think now there was two relays that needed to get replaced, not one. And, you know, that was my fault for doing it. That was my first experience. I do have an inverter on a GE board right now. It's exactly what you said with that. One of the two caps, the big ones is blown. I ordered the cap from Mauser. Um, I have it now. I just haven't put it back together yet. And that, then, that's a tough I, I think I did a uh, inverter repair with the smaller capacitors there's like six small capacitors yeah yeah you did yep I've seen that video you know what's funny though because yeah. I seen that video before I knew you <laughs> it was funny I didn't realize it was you and when I watched it um because you said you'll check all the little ones it's usually the little suckers that go my big problem was your video and everybody else's I couldn't figure out how to get the plastic apart. I ripped it apart and I, bro uh, yeah. I broke it. But that was my big hang up. And once they opened it, I'm like, oh, clearly this capacitor is blown. Yeah. I said, that's my problem. And I'm like, you know what the problem is? Just change it. Because this was a refrigerator that I got for co completely for free. I went and got it, picked it up. And, you know, here I am now. Like, I just want to um, throw, the, throw the board back in it and have it work and you know, we were actually going to use it as a backup refrigerator. Now I'm just going to sell it because if I leave it at the shop, mice will just get it anyway. So, <laughs> right. Well, yeah, the, look, when, when that capacitor shorts, okay. Anytime you have in a uh, board repair, a short circuit, and you know, it was a short, like let's say customer put in a bulb and didn't put it in right. And the the light was on and the, you know, shorts, you know, through the board, something like that. The short circuit can cause a lot of damage to that board. And so you can kind of dig yourself into a hole because it won't cause the same type of damage every time. And that's what I've seen on the, when I've looked into replacing those caps, those two large caps, um, typically there's two, um, some of the old ones have one. Um, is that when you have a short circuit and it's at, you know, those, those caps, they have like 170 volts uh, DC a piece and they're stacked. So it's, you know, 330 total. Um, what happens is, is, uh, is you fry that power supply. So anything before, so you have, um, you know, L1 in neutral over here, then you have a fuse and then you have you know, the power supply, the primary of the power supply, anything, af anything after that capacitor is going to be okay. 
because the short circuit happened at the capacitor. So it goes from here and short, short circuit, circuit, anything in that, uh, that uh, power supply at the primary is going to be, uh, you know, could be taken out. And I, I, and unfortunately there's a lot of surface mount components in there um, that can't, that are in that current path uh, that can be, uh, that can fail. And so for me, it's just, I don't know. Uh, I, I've, I've looked at it, uh, but unfortunately I just got stuck to where I was like, well, I, I'm not seeing the same pattern of failed parts. In other words, I had multiple boards like this that were blown with those, the, the shorted capacitor. And I wasn't seeing a pattern of the same parts over and over. Uh, and I was seeing kind of catastrophic failure. And I was like, uh, this, this is going to be a, a, a bridge too far. And that's why I never did a video on that blown cap. Um, is because it's one, it's, if you don't have a predictable uh, repair, then every time somebody watches my video and attempts it, they can get frustrated because they're just not following, they're following everything I'm doing and I'm saying, and it would have fixed my board maybe, but it's not gonna fix maybe your board. You see what I'm saying? Right. And that's, that's why the, with the capacitors, if you test them and you see, oh yeah, they're bad ESR and you replace those capacitors, and yes, that that capacitor, those two capacitors are obviously good uh, in that case, then I'm not worried about it. There was no short circuit in that case, right? And so the likelihood of anything else on that board being bad is very low. Hmm. Now, I'll tell you that, that, that there's a lot that can go wrong on that inverter board. I've, I've seen... Um, there was one, I don't, I think I did a video on it where there was a surface mount, uh, uh, really, you know, about the size of an ant. It was a capacitor, um, that was, uh, I think it was a tantalum capacitor and, uh, it, it shorted. I, I traced it and I, I found it. I took it out. No more short. I took a, uh, another board that was the same board. Cause I have, I don't know, probably about 20 of them over here stacked up, um, and I found that same capacitor and I just took it out using a, uh, a hot air rework station, took it out, put it on the old board or, or you know, on that, that board and uh, got it, got it up and running. And I think I, I thought I did a video on it or I could have done a post on it. it probably a Ray engineer post. Uh, it was about a year ago or something like that. Hmm. Um, so I'll try to bump that up. Um, if I, uh, you know, if I think about it, if, if you want to see it, you can remind me later if I don't. <laughs> so no, I, I definitely got it. This is, that's going to be one of the first things I tangle with here was that inverter board, but mm -hmm. now I'm starting to wonder what's going to happen with it. It's difficult because I've also tell you know, those six, um, uh, the, the six, uh, IGBTs, those big transistors on the back of the board, they mount them. And that's where the, um, they, they put the, uh, you know, that adhesive so that uh, for the heat conduction, you know, and that's, that's what's difficult to separate. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So now you got to think to yourself, once you separate that, you know, putting a, you got all that, all it, getting it off and then you have to put new stuff that's yeah, like comparable. I don't know. That's just <laughs> the question of reliability in the future is, is I guess my question on that. Um, but um but I've seen those short, those IGBT short, okay? And and usually when there's one, it takes out a, a like, you know, two or three of them, okay? Uh, and then if you got a short circuit, remember what we were talking about, then all of a sudden everything behind the short circuit is suspect. And everything behind the IGBT, if you look at the schematic diagram, you got the output over here and you got the input over here, the IGBTs are like right here. So that means... Now with that short circuit, everything, the whole board basically is suspect because of, of the short. Shorts are very unpredictable. And, and so that's why um, if you have like an open circuit, like let's say a relay is open, the compressor's not running, the motor's not running, it's open. That's the exact opposite of a short circuit and you're very safe. If you just replace that relay, the likelihood of anything else being bad on that board is is unlikely because it failed in an open fashion. If you have something like we're, we're talking about here with short circuit, it's very unpredictable and could cause, cause catastrophic failure 
to where you can replace like, and I had, there's an MCU that I did a, another, um, there's another thread on the MCU, the uh, uh, Whirlpool Maytag front load uh, washers MCU with the kind of think of the error F6 E2, I believe it is um, error. And uh, you, you take apart the, uh, the MCU and you see a big burn mark on the plastic. Uh, have you come across that? I haven't, no. Okay, so so it's it's pretty uh, kind of notorious uh, for you know for on the front load washers there. Well, uh, I endeavored to try to figure it out, and it took me over a year, it's about a year and a half uh, of just piecing it together. Uh, and finally, I actually took a appliance that was my customers, and I brought it into here, and I literally bought a new board. I bought a new stinking MCU for that for that. <laughs> To, to troubleshoot it because I wanted to troubleshoot it live. I wanted to see, okay, this is, this is how it is, how it should be. And this is how it is on the defective board, right? Well, unfortunately I found out that the microprocessor shorts in the process of taking out about between 10 and 12 other parts. Um, and we can't replace microprocessors. So again, that's an example of a short circuit just causing uh, catastrophic failure on a board. So the first question that, you know, I asked myself subconsciously, obviously I don't talk to myself like this, but um, is, okay, the board's failed. Yes. Is, did it, did, was there a short circuit that caused it or is it an open connection of some type that caused it? And then that, that way I'm kind of triaging to see, uh, is this board going to be really worth repairing? And if I think it may, then warning the customer and saying, look, there was a short on the board. I know this and this part is defective, but I'm going to have to put those parts in and see if that's the only defect. Now, one easy example I can give you of when I really wouldn't worry about is there was a frigid air board that I repaired on a, uh, a it was either a washer dryer, I forget. Um, but the varistor fried and the traces around it, it just kind of blew up. Uh, and uh, the traces around it were all fried. Now, why would I not be worried about that that board repair? Because if it's at the beginning of the board. Exactly right. The varistor is going to be at the beginning. That's where uh, the L1 and neutral come, and it's the first thing it hits, right? And then if it sees over voltage, what happens is it'll draw current through the varistor. Right. Let's say if you have a power surge from the, the power company, it'll draw current through the varistor, clamping the voltage. And actually, I made a few videos on this. It's not in the playlist. It's on my YouTube channel. If you look under videos and search uh, MOV or varistor, uh, there's a couple of videos I did on it where it not only clamps it to the normal voltage, but it'll actually over clamp it. Mm -hmm. And so as a protection mechanism for the board. So, so that's why I wasn't worried about it because I was saying, I was saying, look, you know, I'll fix your board and uh, here's the price. I'll have to test everything out afterwards to make sure everything else is good. You know, that's my typical spiel when I repair something. Um, and I put in a new varistor. I fixed the traces. Again, I, I put that on the re-engineers. That was probably about between a year and two years ago. And uh, working great, but it looked bad. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. The original failure looked bad. It's one of those ones where on the groups you you see somebody post and say, "Oh, looks like the board's fried. Now we can do it here. Got to get a new board." That type of a type of a thing. Yeah. Um, but sometimes they look bad, but uh, they're still very very repairable. Sometimes they look very good and they're not repairable at all. <laughs> what, what about? What about the jazz board? What what is the problem with the jazz board? Why does that go? Uh, number one is the compressor relay. Um, people think it's a defrost relay, but what happens is this: so the compressor relay sticks, right? And so the compressor will stay on, and it will cool during defrost. And so it'll never defrost it fully. It'll just heat up the bottom but the compressor is still on. So the evaporator is maintaining very cold temperature. And so it's fight, the heat is fighting the cold 
and it, and it doesn't defrost. So on the board is the compressor relay. Yeah, it's the largest relay. It's a 24 volt uh, DC uh, coil voltage on that one. Because I've always wondered what was, I mean, to me, it's got to be an engineering defect because I, I've seen them boards go after a year, two years. Sure. The, the, there you go. <laughs> speaking of the devil. So I, I'm trying to get some, some better light here. Uh, oh, that's better. <laughs> so that's the relay right there, the, the large one at the end, at the bottom here. Mm. And that's, uh, you know, if you, if you download the files, uh, there we go. Uh, if you download the files for, uh, you know, relays and capacitors, uh, it's going to be in there. It's, yeah. You know what I'm talking about, the files? I, I do. Um, it's showing like, so the ones you stock in your truck and stuff, is that what you're saying? Like the files? Uh, everybody's stock is going to be different. Basically the files are a compilation of mostly my input, but some I've seen input on uh, the re-engineers where they said, oh, look, I fixed this board on a, on something maybe I don't work on. And then sure. I'm like, okay, well, we'll just add it to the, uh, to the, the files. Yeah. So what do you type? Would you, if you want to search files, do you type it by model number or? Um, no. Just, no. Uh, you put uh, relays, capacitors. Um, it, there's there's a few, there's like three different files. One is a uh, a beginner or a starter kit that you can put together. It's probably about maybe fifteen to twenty parts um, of the most basic stuff we're talking about, like the Jazzboard relay like the uh, uh, French or bottom mount uh, Iceland board, uh, 10 microfarad capacitor. The, the ones that, you know, we all kind of see the F1 uh, motor um, relay, right? For the Whirlpool dryers, the ones we see most, that's gonna be on that short list. But then you have a master relay list that I think has, I don't know, it's probably six, seven revisions on it. Uh, just cause, you know, I'll update it probably every uh, three or four months. Uh, so that list is, is pretty extensive. You're probably looking at maybe 30, 30 or plus relays on that list. And then you also have a capacitor list with about probably uh, 25 plus capacitors on the master capacitor list. So for those people that just want a, a starter kit, they go for the, the, the small file. And I, I, I bump that. I tag people that ask about it. Uh, and then if, if, uh, if they want the, the larger files, I bump those sometimes, but, uh, yeah, if you just, you know, go to the files, you can search them all yourself. Um, especially if on your, uh, you know, people are on the computer, it's much easier to navigate the re-engineers, uh, using the search function and the files on the computer rather than on a phone or a tablet. Oh yeah. Yeah. God. Yeah. Yeah. I work for myself. Uh, what what state are you in? Uh, Kansas. Kansas. Wow. All right. Yeah, I I own my own the own company with Moses, and I'm in New Jersey. Oh, all right. All right. Best decision I ever made. Oh, I know. Trust me. I I wish I made mine sooner. I um. I worked for a company that was go 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 go. I'm sure you you've all been there. And yeah, twenty jobs a day. That was my average. How much? 20 jobs. 20? I could, I'd never done 20. Were they all next door to each other? Um, it was a pretty, um, it was, first of all, a lot of warranty. So customer service was not a priority. Yeah. It was more like uh, I walk in, I check it without even taking a part of anything. And I'm like, I'll see you when I get in the part. And I'll get, you know, three, four parts of what it probably is. Um. Also, there was a lot of warranty work, so a lot of manufacturer work. So you already kind of like, you already thought three failing in the first year, so you already know that you're gonna get a repeated issue. So you already walk in, you say, ah, I already seen a twin so many before, mm -hmm. just order parts. So there was a lot of those type of calls. My record is 27 calls in one day. Wow. Um, but um, I got tired of it. They can't get a technician that could finish six nowadays, but. Uh, <laughs> <you know. laughs> How long ago was that, Isaac? 
I started my own company two years ago and I left the company about a year ago. So, um, and I worked here for 11 years. Um, yeah, I mean, I probably about two, three years ago, I realized that I'm already like tired of it and I started already going down. Um, so I didn't, you know, I started going down. I couldn't complete that many cones anymore. Um, but it was just like, I like fixing appliances. I really, truly enjoy it. Um, but over there, it was like just dread, you know, it was just time to move on. Yeah. I definitely make more money that way. Now, what is your guys, you, you guys are both in the field doing about the same calls? Um. Well, technically, we tell the office that we want to do, our goal is six or seven calls. In reality, we probably end up doing anywhere from eight to 12 calls a day, depending on the area. Some areas are like more condensed, so we can do them more often, more calls. Moses wakes up earlier than me, so he does more calls, which is probably why he didn't join, because he already went to sleep. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll I'll post it on the YouTube so you can watch uh -huh. it. Yeah, yeah good, good stuff. Did you have any uh, Isaac or Jeremy? Uh, either one? Did you guys have uh, questions on what uh, anything we discussed here? No, everything is pretty clear. I mean, you know, I can't believe I didn't start with the board repairs earlier. I can only imagine what kind of damage I did to the landfill. Yeah, yeah that's a problem. Uh, and, and the re-engineers is all about that, is, is just trying to get the complete, uh, whatever we can, as long as it's going to be a good quality complete, uh, not necessarily only board repair, but also, you know, just different, uh, you know, when you have a part that's in LA that's not a board, you know, and you, you get take it from another manufacturer and kind of rework it and make it work. And, you know, it's, it's really nice to have a group of uh, really competent technicians that'll say oh well if you do that then you got to watch out for this or do that or this is what i've you know come across and yeah it's it's really nice to see that uh that we have a, a real civil group uh that can engage well uh as far as re-engineering yeah a lot of good i don't know i don't i don't enjoy the other groups where every single answer is somebody says this is a lawsuit waiting to happen <laughs> Yeah. Now we we had a few of those back kind of in the early stages of the re-engineers where people were saying, you know, oh, you're gonna get sued, you're gonna, you know, cause a fire and all this kind of stuff. And eventually they just worked out of the group. Um, you know, if you understand that the problem is is that as soon as you step on the customer's property, uh, there's liability instantly. You know, it doesn't you know, that's why I pay insurance. Yeah. Insur insurance covers anything that I deem to be safe. Right. You got a lot more, a lot more chance that you're going to slip and fall on somebody's where I'm from anyway. The ice they're not removing here, then you are going to burn their dryer down. <laughs> well, the last one that I had a scare on was actually the only time uh, was uh, a whirlpool part that came new defective, um, and. I'll, I'll tell you guys about it is it, it was the uh, side by side uh, whirlpool with the um, water filter housing in the bottom. And what had happened was, is I got a new uh, housing and when it came in the bag, it was in a bag, it wasn't in the box. Uh, it was a different one. I know there's a couple of, there's like a few different versions of the same type of thing, but they're, they're closed, but they're not interchangeable. And part of it was just hanging in the bag. It was like dangling in the bag. Uh, it was, it was the John guest fitting insert. Okay. It was just, I was, and so I looked at it. I was like, I look at the parts guy. I said, well, this is, I can't, I can't use this. It's all busted. And, uh, and so he returned it and then got me another one. And it was not, it was all whole and not, there was no dangling parts. And, um, and so I was like, okay, well, I got, I had a new defective part. We sent it back and I got a, a, a new one and all's well. So I went and installed it in the customer's home, right? In the, in the fridge, right? 
and uh, it installed fine. You know, there's two hoses that go into it, and it installed perfectly fine. Well, what happened, and I showed the customer, you know, every step, what happened. In other words, this one came new, but it was defective. And, you know, I showed him pictures of, you know, the, the, the new one that I installed and everything. So I had everything really documented really well. And it's really good because I needed it. <laughs> um, in the end, uh, what happened that night after I installed it, turned on the water, tested it out, everything was good. I left, collected, left, and uh, that that water line came out of that John Guest fitting, and it was this, it was the same the same fitting that was dangling on the other one that I had sh sent back. So it's like they had a bad batch of these where, the, where they didn't they didn't connect them correctly. So I'm going to go back for a minute. What what type of refrigerator was it? Whirlpool. Oh, all right. With the filter in the bottom on the left side. All right. And yeah, I know there's a few different uh, filters uh, that have that, but uh, some of them, you know, the, the nubs that come out with the John Guest fittings in there um, are just one single piece of molded plastic, right? But uh, that's, that's on most of them. But on one, they have a separate plastic insert that's like either glued or I don't know how they attach it, but it's a separate piece of plastic from the, the whole rest of the housing, okay? And evidently that thing did not get uh, secured in there like it should, uh, either glued in or, or however they, they do it at the factory. Um, and that's that, and it bust, and then it flooded their kitchen and their floors and everything. And I came back because obviously they called me back, and I took pictures and I said, "Look, I, I'm sorry. There's no way I could know about this. Obviously, we had some sort of bad batch from Whirlpool, and you know, you need to take it up with them. I, you know, show them the pictures. Uh, I sent them all the pictures, um, and I don't know what happened because they never." call me back. I, you know, I offered to help them out. Obviously I comp them for their whole repair. Um, but I don't, I don't, I don't think it was my fault at all, but the, the flaw is in the design. Uh, Whirlpool needs to have the, a, a water valve, um, before the fridge, you know, on the back, they have to have a separate, they should have a separate water valve before it goes to the filter housing. And that's that's where the design is flawed. Most other brands do that. Well, uh, I think that's a good uh, good stopping point. We're over two hours, and uh, that's okay. It's only us left, you know. <laughs> yeah, but I'm gonna go pass out. <laughs> yeah, I gotta go too. Yeah, well, I, gotta go. I gotta lay in this jet. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Tom Cruise. <laughs> So, all right. Well, uh, we'll see you guys on the on the reengineers. We'll, you know, plan to have one of these a month. Okay. Okay, Mike. Good night. We'll see you, bye. Bye, bye. Thanks for being here. Bye. All right.